Olá, estamos na nova School of Business and Economics em Carcavelos para dar início a mais um programa do mês da Ciência e Educação da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos. A biodiversidade do nosso planeta está a ser seriamente afetada pelo agravamento das alterações climáticas. Os especialistas calculam que se a temperatura global aumentar para 3 graus centígrados acima dos níveis pré-industriais, então dois terços das espécies ficarão extintas. Embora esta ameaça esteja num horizonte mais distante, o facto é que os danos causados à biodiversidade devido às alterações climáticas já são evidentes no dia de hoje. Hoje vamos falar com uma perita nesta temática. Natalie Seddon é diretora do departamento da Nature Based Solutions Initiative e professora de biodiversidade também na Universidade de Oxford. Ela acredita que a preservação da biodiversidade pode também contribuir para mitigar muitos dos impactos das alterações climáticas no planeta em questões como segurança alimentar, seca, inundações e captura de dióxido de carbono. Vamos começar a nossa conversa com a Natalie, que está na Universidade de Oxford. Great to have an opportunity to speak with you, Natalie. This is such an important topic. And I think to kick things off, uh, let's start with a, a definition of, in your mind, what is biodiversity. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I think it's great to start with this question because actually there's a lot of confusion about mm -hmm. what the term biodiversity means. I mean, it is ultimately a contraction of two words, bio biological and diversity. And it was coined by um, the Earth Summit, um, E.O. Wilson and others coined the term biodiversity. And it's put very simply, it's the diversity of life from the level of the gene to the level of the ecosystem on land and in the sea. And it's also the interactions between genes, species, and ecosystems. So in other words, it's a multi-dimensional construct. It's a property of nature. And it's a property of nature that basically secures the flow of all that we need from the natural world as part of the natural world. So it's not a panda, it's not a tiger, it's not a mahogany tree, it's not a charismatic species of conservation concern. It is that diversity um, that, that, that underpins the term biodiversity. We're going to have an opportunity to uh, go deeper into this topic, obviously, and, and, and explain why, why it matters and, and what is happening now with, with global warming. When I think of biodiversity, I think of animals of all shapes and sizes and how and and, and obviously uh, vegetation and how all of these elements are interconnected and mm -hmm. I think in, in my lifetime I'm 47 years old we've been hearing more and more about the impact of species disappearing and what that could mean for the overall equilibrium of the planet so let's get into that as well why does it matter so much that we protect biodiversity and species which could be at the risk of, of extinction well healthy ecosystems whatever they are whether they're on land whether they're along our coasts or in our oceans those healthy ecosystems rich in biodiversity, rich in biological life, are the foundation, the very foundation of healthy, thriving communities and economies. I mean, put in the simplest term, healthy nature, underpinned by that biological richness, is essentially our life support system. You know, it's the source of our food, our clean water, our medicines, ecosystems, healthy ecosystems, protect us from environmental change, particularly the impacts of climate change. We'll get onto that. They draw down and store carbon so it can slow warming. We could also get into that, but they also support, you know, our mental health, our spiritual well-being. They're a source of inspiration. It's like multitudes of material, spiritual, cultural security reasons why we need healthy ecosystems and why they're so valuable to us in multiple ways. And yet, and yet we have developed as if nature, as if the biodiversity that underpins nature has absolutely no value mm. at all. Um, and I think one key thing in a warming world, in a rapidly changing world, where we know a lot of change is coming, but from one place to the next, we're not sure what that change might look like. Biodiversity is even more important. It's more important than ever because that diversity, and this is backed up with many, many decades of experiments, shows that the diversity and the connectivity 
of our natural ecosystems is underpins their resilience. So those biodiverse connected ecosystems are much more resilient to climate extremes, to droughts, to floods. They're much more resilient to pests and diseases and fires and all these things that are getting more and more intense and frequent under climate change. The healthier the ecosystem, the more likely it is to continue to give all that it needs and support people in multiple ways despite all that change. So that's so it's always been important, but I would say biodiversity is becoming more and more important as the climate warms. It's interesting, Natalie, because I think climate change, be fair to say, over the last uh, a decade uh, has, has become a trending topic and we know about the effect, or at least people discuss the effect that climate change has on human beings. However, on the biodiversity side, there's not as much public I would say, information or discussion about that. So how does, we know what climate change will mean for the human beings, but, and, and we've talked about the two degrees increase and what a three degrees increase could signify as well for, for extinction of species. And maybe we'll, we'll discuss that too, but how does climate change specifically affect biodiversity uh, around the world? So it affects us in multiple ways. And it affects the biodiversity, which in turn affects the people. So I think it's important in our narrative when we talk about these things, not to so much separate impacts from people from impacts on okay. biodiversity. We are part of it. Yeah. But let's talk more specifically about what happens to species when the climate changes. Well, you know, an organism can do one of four things when it's environment, it's preferred environment. So when the environment in which it can reproduce and flourish changes, it can do one of four things. It can either move... So it can either track its moving ecological niche across space. And we see this all over the world with range shifts. So we know that, you know, birds and butterflies and other organisms are moving north in the northern hemisphere or they're moving upslope in mountainous regions to track their niche, ecological niche, as it, as it shifts across the landscape. So they can do that. But I'll get back to some caveats about that in a bit. Okay. They can change their behavior to deal with it. So they can change when they do critical things. So they when they reproduce, so when they when plants flower, when birds lay um, eggs, when when birds sing or when amphibians spawn or whatever it might be, they can they can change when they do it so that their offspring are born at a time where there are sufficient resources to support them. And we find examples of this all over the world where plants are flowering sooner, birds are laying their, net, their eggs up to sort of three weeks earlier now than they did in the 1960s. And there's a you know, wealth of examples on land and in the sea across all sorts of different organi organi types of organisms of them adjusting their behaviour mm. to try and keep track of the changes that arise as a result of, of, of climate change. The third thing they could do potentially is adapt so that they could have some sort of, you know, genetic evolution. They can, they can, they can change how they do things and that could have a genetic basis so they can change their phenotype or their, you know, so they're better suited to their location. And that could be genetic or it could be cultural. So you've got adaptation. And if they can't do any of these things, then they'll go extinct. Mm. And so, and so whilst there is evidence that organisms are moving or changing behavior or adapting, the pace of environmental change is so fast that actually it's, it's, we can't, we can't hope that evolution will save them. You know, and, and there was one study that showed that actually the rates of, um, you know, environmental change are 10,000 times faster than the rates of the required genetic evolution for, for certain groups of organisms. And there have been other studies showing that big mismatch. The other problem with, you know, just thinking, well, things can move is like, what we've done to the landscapes through our roads, through our industrial agriculture, through our urbanization, is we greatly fragmented our landscapes. And so it's even if organisms could move, and not all of them can, they might not be able to get to where they need to because of the disruption. And so some of the critical things and, and where um, species extinction is particularly at risk, where, where there's a higher risk of species extinction, is where you've got that um, interplay between climate change on the one hand and land use change. Okay. And what climate change is doing at the moment is amplifying the negative impacts of the destruction and degradation and fragmentation of the ecosystems. The other thing is even if we hadn't done that, um, then you know, it's not like all members of a stable, healthy ecological community can all move at the same rate. You know, these communities that are underpin healthy environments have taken millennia, millions and millions of years to evolve. And while some species that are quite mobile could move, the, the things that they need 
their predators or their prey or whatever it might be, their parts that can't move at the same time. So what we're seeing on Earth is sort of novel species communities forming. And we're not sure whether those, those communities are stable or not. Mm. Um, and so some of them might be, and this is a very active area of scientific research. So that, that, so then you get these sort of mismatches between, so you might have, you know, not enough prey in a certain area that you know, a bird might be, say, breeding earlier, but then if the prey aren't available because they're a different organism. So there's all these complexities. Uh, which means that that um, increasingly climate change, especially in its interaction with other stresses, land use change and pollution, mm. will produce more extinction. Now, climate change to date hasn't taken too many species out of the species assemblage of the planet. Um, those extinctions that we're seeing tend to be, you know, amphibians in mountainous regions, for example, coral reefs that are very, very sensitive to very small changes in sea surface temperature. We're seeing some extinctions there. Um, but, but with the current trajectories of three or four degrees warmer by the end of the century, if we keep on with emissions as they are, then climate change then will become the number one driver of species extinction. But at the moment, it's sort of acting as an amplifier. So hopefully that's been reasonable clear on what those impacts are. Um, it, it, yeah. it, it is clear, and I think you've been extensive in your, in, in your uh, explanation of all the factors that are uh, uh, um, changing as a result of, of, of climate change and biodiversity and the ecological uh, or the ecosystems for, for different species. But paint a picture for us, for us now of, of, of what's happening as we speak in, in 2022. Um, if it is worse than it was in 2012 or in 2002, uh, and, and what regions of the planet are, are most affected um, in, in, in your experience and expertise? So, yeah, I mean, a state of nature, I mean, what's, what is very clear, and we have a lot of technology out there which is sort of mapping, mapping and monitoring what's happening to biodiversity. So we're getting an increasingly clear and accurate idea of what, what mm. the state of it all is. And what, it, what is very clear is that we are, through various activities, and we can talk about what those activities are, if you like, in due course, but what we're mm. seeing is the erosion of biodiversity at the level of the gene, species and population. Um, you know, we're seeing steep declines in the abundance and diversities of plants, animals, fungi and microbes across multiple trophic levels within, within habitats and of ecosystems locally and globally and on land and in the ocean. So everything is in steep, steep decline. And so some sort of key headlines are that, you know, human beings have modified over 50% of land cover and we use 40% of the primary productivity of plants. And this, this demand for primary productivity for biobiomass far outstrips the supply. Um, we know that, you know, we've seen since the 1970s an average of a 68% decline in the population sizes of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles and fish. This is 68% decline. Interestingly, during that wow. same time frame, we've seen a big increase in the extent of protected area coverage. It hasn't really had any impact on that. We've lost 80% of our animal biomass in the last 100 years. So 82% decline in wild mammals on land and 80% decline in wild fish in the oceans. I mean, put simply, our ecosystems are empty, essentially empty. You, know, you walk through forests, you don't hear much. It's because it's essentially empty. And one worrying thing is that we've sort of normalized that that whole shifting baseline thing where we've over time just got used to you know ecosystems and maybe looking pretty but actually not containing the full set of species they need to be defined as healthy and one of the perhaps most stark um, calculations that was done in recent years is if we look at vertebrate mass on the planet 96 percent of vertebrate mass are people livestock people and their livestock basically four percent uh has been left for for, for wild animals Wow. So it's, you know, it's, it's really, really bad. And, and no, you know, no, and I, there are reasons for this which we could get into. And, and I appreciate you saying that because I, I do think it's important to raise awareness to this factor. But how, how seriously are, are, are governments and NGOs and decision makers taking, taking this, this issue, you think? In, in, in the conversations you have and the experts you also discuss with, mm -hmm. uh, how, how aware are they of it and how urgent do they see um, a, a change of behavior? So we have seen a shift in the narrative around this in recent years. You know, nature and its biodiversity are increasingly discussed as being critically important in spaces they were never even considered before. So in the highest levels of government in the UN, increasingly in boardrooms of all the major companies of the world, the big commodity companies, 
you know, it was a, um, nature was for the first time a major theme at a climate change conference, so COP26 in Glasgow, hosted by the UK, biodiversity and nature was a huge theme there, big commitments from all the multilateral development banks to make nature, in their words, central to decision making, you know, never has nature been more prominent, at least in word, on the agenda, we've got okay. a lot more regulation around ESG coming, you know, it's, it's, it's changed quite considerably now but these are all words so lots of high level pledges lots of promises you know you know you know in some ways that's something to celebrate absolutely it's 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 you know it's it's nature is there whereas it hasn't been biologists are, are the views of biologists are increasingly sought after so there is that recognition and there is more funding being channeled towards it. But if you look at how funding is sort of allocated mm. between the different, we looked at the sustainable development goals and we bundled them on top of each other in terms of their importance or interdependence. You know, we've got one planet with one climate system. So the biosphere and the climate at the bottom of that, then you've got society, you've got the society and the economy and all of those right. sustainable development goals are important. But then when you look at the flow of funding, it's inversely related. So we'll pour enormous amounts in trying to support the economy in peace or war, depending on how you look at it, and human health all up here. Then you get down to tiny amounts of funding going onto the climate and even smaller amounts going into protecting the biosphere, yeah. going into protecting the lives. So the whole thing is completely the wrong way around. But it, but it is shifting, at least in the narrative, and there is more funding available for nature restoration than there has been before. But the problem is that amount of funding is massively outweighed by the flow of finance from subsidies to activities that incentivize the destruction of the biosphere and the pollution of, of, of the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. So that's trillions of subsidies go into those really destructive activities and billions are coming in. Finally, billions are coming in, which is more we used to be talking in millions. Now we're talking billions of, right. of, of dollars a year coming in for, for nature, but it's still dwarfed. And so in some ways, all this sort of like smaller scale funding and, and conservation activities, which are sort of being broadly recognized, at least in the, in the way people are speaking, you know, that's that's much bigger than it was before. But unless we sort of address this, you know, that's just the other activities are just papering over the cracks or, you know, metaphor <laughs> rearranging chairs on the Titanic. So this, this mm. is that's that's often the elephant room. We're sort of giving with one hand and taking with the other. And we're taking a lot by by by, by subsidizing and destruction of nature. So. Let's let's take another point of view, <laughs> Natalie, because we've we've discussed how climate change is affecting biodiversity. How can biodiversity help protect us and us being the planet from climate change? How would an increase in mm -hmm. biodiversity and in the and making sure that the number of of, of species not only uh, um, stabilize but maybe increase mm. on, on the number of of wild animals, as you said, how, how would that help mm. the planet to, to, mm. to protect uh, us from, from climate change? So healthy ecosystems, so the protection and restoration of our ecosystems and the more sustainable management of our working lands plays an absolutely critical role in addressing both the causes and also the con consequences or the impacts of climate change. I think what's another sort of a good thing talking about the narrative that's happened in recent years is that biodiversity loss and climate change are recognized as being two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. you know, in our ecosystems, our healthy ecosystems that you know are underpinned by you know species rich assemblages by biodiversity are very rich in carbon so the destruction or conversion results in the release of this carbon into the atmosphere as, as carbon dioxide or methane primarily and in fact we know that land use change through you know, agriculture forestry and other land uses is the biggest driver of biodiversity on land but also is one of the biggest um, causes of greenhouse gas emissions 22 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions come from land use change so protecting or restoring that carbon that's locked up in the system you know is critical to slow climate warming um, and that that's 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 really essential to understand that um, but working with nature can also, as I say, help to support human adaptation. So sort of whatever mitigation action we take to try and slow warming, there's a lot of warming that's already locked into the systems. So it's absolutely essential that we talk about and think about adaptation as well. And people all over the world have been working with nature to help them deal with the impacts of, of droughts and floods and all sorts of things like that for a very, very long period of time. And we've got a lot of learning uh, from those communities um, is very, very, very valuable. We know that, you know, you know, 
working with nature can help reduce our exposure to climate extremes so flooding along coasts or heat waves in cities they can reduce our sensitivity to climate change for example by supporting diverse livelihoods and sources of income and it can also um, working with nature can also increase our capacity what's called adaptive capacity our capacity to deal with future shocks and change because social capital as well as natural capital mm. is built as you implement these so-called nature-based solutions but the, the thing is is alignment between biodiversity uh, conservation climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation is not at all guaranteed and it's important to be clear on that it critically depends on three three issues one is that we keep fossil fuels in the ground mm -hmm. because unless we keep fossil fuels in the ground the resultant warming will turn the biosphere through fires and so forth into a net source of greenhouse gas emissions and there's already parts of the biosphere where this is happening um, and then also depends on whether interventions are designed to support biodiversity so monoculture plantations for example are not really going to help us address the climate crisis they're going to help us address a biomass potentially a biomass challenge, but not a climate, um, climate change challenge because a lot of that, that carbon is, is released back into the atmosphere quite quickly and because they're very, you know, they're not resilient to the impacts of change because they're not biodiverse. And then the other critical thing is that, you know, the rights and knowledges of local communities need to be taken into account. Um, and so if, if you get those three things in place, then the protection restoration of biodiversity can help us while play a significant role in helping us address the climate challenge, but not unless you do. You mentioned adaptation to climate change, and, and, and I wanted to ask you about the work that, that you specifically do. Um, you, you founded and you direct um, the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative at the University of Oxford. So what projects do you, do you undertake, um, and how do you hope uh, it, it, it impacts the, the, the adaptation to, to mm -hmm. an ever-changing environment? So what we've been doing um, at the Nature Based Solutions Initiative for a number of years has been collating evidence on the multiple ways in which working with nature can help deal with different forms of impacts of, of climate change. Um, and so there's sort of you know four very broad categories of types of projects that can really help with this. So sort of briefly mentioned earlier, but let me talk about them in a bit more detail. So we're protecting our coastal ecosystems is really, really important uh, in terms of addressing sort of the direct impacts of climate change, sea level rise, storm mm -hmm. surges, and so on. We know there's a wealth of evidence, you know, we've collated some of it that these protecting those coastal ecosystems, kelp forests, seagrass meadows, salt marshes, oyster reefs, mangrove forests. Forests. Yeah. This can defend against storm storms, reduce the energy of waves, um, slow saltwater intrusion, stabilize those slopes, support nurse, import, economically important nurseries that support big fisheries. You know, there's multiple benefits that are really, um, really particularly um, important in a warming world. So that whole what goes on the coastal zone very important. Meanwhile, there's, we also collected evidence that if you restore your forests and your wetlands, your peatlands and so forth within water catchments, this can help regulate water supplies, shield communities and infrastructure from floods, erosion and landslides and so forth. Okay. So that's sort of protection and restoration. And then a huge, huge amount of benefit working with nature comes from within our working lands. So our croplands and our timberlands and so forth. We use nature-based agricultural practices such as agroforestry, um, or which is very common practice increasingly so in certain areas of sub-Saharan Africa, helps to enhance or stabilize yields in increasingly dry climates. Or floating gardens, which is a sort of an adaptation to increase flooding happening in Southeast Asia. That's an innovation that emerged from Bangladesh. This can increase the resilience of, of the agricultural systems and the communities dependent upon them within that working landscape. And then within cities, incredible amounts of um, you know, it, it rich data coming in from implementing nature-based solutions in cities, so green and blue infrastructure, this could, that this can really help with cooling during heat waves and flood abatements, also evidence of, that it can deal with, you know, reducing air pollution, providing mental and physical health benefits. So those are the sort of the broad categories. And what we've been doing is bringing together evidence from science and practice, um, including through our partnerships globally on, on the ways in which, multiple ways in which working with nature just makes sense in a warming world. Um, and not just the lower income countries that are really dependent on nature for the livelihoods, but increasingly in the global north where our cities are getting you know, increasingly impacted and our landscapes more broadly increasingly impacted by climate change. Are, are there any best practice examples that you can share with us uh, regarding uh, work that, that, that certain cities are, are doing to find nature-based solutions to improve their, their, uh, their landscape? 
So there's a lot, been a lot of work in Europe um, on, it's interesting, quite a lot of work on nature-based solutions within Europe has been really focused on, on cities, okay. on bringing you know, green roofs and green walls. And in fact, in Lisbon, um, there's been a lot of work here um, as part of the master development plan. Mm -hmm. So building with nature to increase the resilience of Lisbon is quite a big thing. We have lots of lots of interesting and good practice and learning from, from the city. In particular, there's been a big emphasis in investing in green corridors to connect the green spaces. And I mentioned that sort of, you know, resilient nature and therefore resilient people really depends on ecosystems, not only being diverse, but connected. Because we talked earlier about how there is, you know, an impact on climate change on species is that species often move. Mm -hmm. And so ecosystems need to be connected. And so this is, this is a really good thing to do that builds the resilience of the city and its human inhabitants, but also mm -hmm. enables ecosystems involved themselves to be to be healthy there's also been you know urban parks so funding going into the establishment of urban urban parks and urban farms in particular in lisbon so this is this speaks to many different agendas doesn't it it speaks to the need to reconnect people with nature to make them healthier to make them more adaptive and more resilient there's evidence that this is really helping reduce the temperatures during um, during heat waves, um, that it um, increases the humidity. You know, you have more green things growing in a city, increases the humidity, which is really important. Again, in a, in a warming world, reduces stormwater runoff and ground drainage. You sort of remove some of the concrete and you get natural structures in there and you increase the infiltration of water into the soils and the ground rather than having the runoff, which causes all the floods. So there are some really there is some really good work being done all over Europe, and I just wanted good. to highlight some of the stuff that's going on in Lisbon too. Um, and we could do we are doing some 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 of that work in the UK. There's some great great work going on in Newcastle, Manchester. Some work bringing floating ecosystems in, into some of our major cities, those that have big rivers, for example. Um, but a lot more that we could be doing, and so it's important that these different um, cities learn from one another and, and mm -hmm. sort of trade their trade, trade their knowledge and what's working, what's not working. I imagine reducing Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is also an important uh, factor. H how can the preservation of, of biodiversity help in this aspect? So yes, this is a really, really important to talk about this because actually there's quite a lot of misinformation okay. or confusion again about the role of its nature, nature and its biodiversity and climate change mitigation. And for a while there's been this sort of meme in circulation saying, oh, nature can provide 30% of the climate change solution. Mm -hmm. Um, which is problematic because it sort of implies um, that that 30% is standalone. You're just going to get that by looking after nature. Um, but the fact is, and I mentioned it already, that you you, you don't get the 30% unless you um, get the 70% as well through decarbonisation. So we recently addressed this, this problem by at Oxford by reframing the mitigation potential of nature-based solutions in terms of the Paris Agreement, so the Paris Agreement to keep warming within two degrees um, and whilst pursuing efforts to keep it to within one degree. So looking at temperature rather than percentages, because percentages are always pretty misleading, aren't they? And what we, it's very difficult to do this because there are so many caveats in, in, in involved and those models, those, especially when you're looking at the global level. But what we tried to calculate, what would be the maximum we could get from, if we scaled up nature-based solutions the maximum step possible, so we did all the protection we could, we restored ecosystems in ecologically appropriate places, we looked after our work lands and did more regenerative agriculture all constrained by you know land use land tenure as much as possible um, taking into account a whole variety of different sort of socio and ecological factors as best we could um, we estimated that the total mitigation potential in the land use sector is about 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year and what we figured out from our analysis is this amounts to reducing um, global warming by around 0.3 of a degree if we peak um, towards the end of the centuries at two degrees. So if we manage to keep the temperature right. rise globally to two degrees before the end of the century, and if we start invest in nature-based solutions now, do all these good things in the natural world now, then we'll get around 0.3 of a degree. Difference. Yeah. Now this is this is, you know, viewed for one lens, you might think, well, that's quite a small contribution to global warming, but it becomes hugely significant, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, when looked in the context of the severe social, economic and ecological impacts of a two degree versus a mm -hmm. 1.5 mm -hmm. degree warmer world. Mm -hmm. The IPCC did that analysis, didn't they, where they said, what's the world going to look like under 1.5 degrees versus two degrees? And it's huge massive like you know really really important significant difference there which is why we're fighting to keep the 1.5 degrees target alive but view within that context it will 0.3 is actually pretty decent that's really yeah. good um 
but it's still a lot smaller than what, the, than what has to be achieved through the decarbonisation of the global economy. Um, because if we don't, as I said, that warming that results will actually turn that biosphere into a net source of greenhouse gas emissions and the whole thing will accelerate. So that's important. The problem is, is that many organisations have been using, you know, say, basically, the, you know, could be accused of, being, of doing greenwashing in the sense of, say, oh, well, well, we'll invest in nature-based solutions or we'll invest in tree planting, but we won't do at the same time do everything we possibly can to keep fossil fuels in the ground. It's, you know, you can't, you have to do both. It's not an either or. And so we really have to be careful on that one and really call out those companies and those um, businesses that are doing that because, you know, we don't want, you know, the recognition of the valuable role of nature to delay or distract investment in decarbonisation. And so that's that's that we have to be really really careful about that, and why we need to we need to be careful about what good looks like when it comes to investments in nature based solutions. I, I think, and, and uh, according to conversations we've we've had as part of this series, it's clear that different areas of the planet are in different stages of decarbonization as well, right? And mm -hmm. goals are different depending on where you go, on yeah, what the economic exactly. evolution is or development is, and, and and some areas of the world. And we've talked about. Um, India, we've talked about China, they're still depending a lot on, uh, on fossil fuels also to mm. speed up their, their, their advancement to, to, to compete with other, with other economies. Um, how, how would you grade the planet in this process of, of decarbonization and, and, and uh, transition to, to renewable energy? And um, mm -hmm. is, is, is trapping carbon dioxide also a a valid solution and an important solution looking looking into the future what what's what's your view on that on yeah you mean technology versus yeah i think we will need technology ultimately to pull carbon dioxide mm. out of the atmosphere mm. and put it in the ground however that technology is nowhere near ready to go to scale gotcha. whereas nature is there ready to be protected and restored and we absolutely have to if we want to meet net zero on our other major climate goals so it's like we do need to invest in the development of the technology but that might be ready by you know in a few decades or even by the end of the century Meanwhile, what we do over the next few decades is going to determine whether or not the Earth is habitable by humanity for the foreseeable future. So it's like we do need technology, and I never sort of, and, and certainly when it comes to adaptation, I would say here mm -hmm. and now, mm -hmm. we need both in many contexts. It's a question of like working out how they can work together. But in terms of that sort of geological, you know, storage, uh, then that whole piece is important. We need to invest in it, but we also need to recognize that it's, 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 you know, it's it's going to be ready to take scale much further into the future, by which time we need to have basically addressed the climate change challenge. So it's like once we've reached peak, then we're going to need this technology. So to answer that, in terms of, um, of regional variation, huge regional variation, I was going to say, actually, you have to caveat these global models and say, well, that's the global picture. Mm -hmm on nature, mm -hmm. but obviously some countries have very, very, very high emissions and very mm -hmm. low uh, native vegetation. And actually in those countries, you know, nature can offer only a small part of their mitigation challenge in their solution. Whereas other countries, the Congo, Brazil, Indonesia, places that still have a lot of forests and peatlands and other critical ecosystems, and actually historically only have very low emissions, then they can get very close to meeting their or if they, you know, they can really only meet their net zero goals if they implement nature-based solutions, if they avoid further deforestation or ecosystem loss and damage. So, you know, those percentages and those figures definitely change region by region. And those countries, particularly tropical countries, the potential for nature to help them meet their climate goals is very, very high. Whereas sort of um, up in the, in the northern areas or in the northern temperate zone is a lot lower. We have higher emissions, we have lower vegetation cover, so it's a different different, different solutions required at different scales. So it's really important. It has to come from the country and it has to be bottom up. That climate change policy is, is very much, as you say, region specific and these global generalizations can kind of see what the, the general direction of the policy landscape needs to be, but they certainly, you know, it needs to you know, be refined very much at the national level, as you uh, say. Yeah, uh, and... and We've talked about about uh, the the nature-based solutions initiative uh, uh, project. You're also a professor at, at the University of Oxford, and what I wanted to ask you is in the uh, interaction you have with, with with your students, and in the interviews you give, like this one, in the um, presentations you make, in the speeches you give, what do you tell people they can actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, what, what, what message should we be sharing here on this show and should I be sharing with my community 
about people getting involved in projects specifically at ground level mm -hmm. that can affect the protection of biodiversity, that can mm -hmm. reduce uh, 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 the impact of, of, of carbonization. I mean, because governments, and we've talked about that, governments, NGOs, they, they, they can do a lot, but then it comes down to people playing, playing their part. And as we continue to grow as a population, you know, the more, the more there are of us, the more damage we can make and the more uh, um, uh, protection we can also uh, try to deploy in our, in our, in our behavior. So what, what, what message do you normally share with, with your students and with, with, with people you interact mm. with as, a, as an expert? So that's that's another great question. I mean, it is very easy to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And especially young people do generally feel very anxious and very overwhelmed by the earth that they have inherited mm -hmm. and the prospects for a happy future. But there is, and I always say, there is so much we can do and we must do as individuals. You know, what we do influences many others. It has this ripple effect. None of us are islands. What we do affects our families, whether they like it or not, it affects their friends. Right their friends and families, right. their communities, that ripple effect is important. So if anyone says, oh, well, what we know, what's the point of me doing this? I'm just one person, you're not, none of us are. We're fractally interconnected as these communities. So everything we do, we do affects lots of others. And so this is this power and that's like, you can change things and you can be an agent of change and make your future a more positive place. That's like a general response, but there are, you know, critically um, critical actions that we can do for biodiversity, climate change and health. We, we can do now, you know, and a critical one, especially when we think about biodiversity and also climate is changing our diet. You know, that has a single really, really incredibly important thing that we can all must do. We all must shift towards a plant dominated, if not a plant, entirely plant based diet. There's a big, big drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss, right? industrial agriculture, industrial animal agriculture. That's the first one. We need to vote, <laughs> right? Um, we need to vote for those who prioritize climate and nature. That's really important because there are those that really care. You know, and there and are they need those who don't. And it's becoming and increasingly polarized, right, as well. Yeah, and so we need to vote. And a lot of young people say, what's the point in voting? You know, it's like, no, we need to vote. We need to, to, to exercise that right. Those of us who live in countries where that's a possibility, we need to exercise that right. We need to stop consuming things we don't need and that harm the environment. If it harms the environment, is likely to harm you as well, yeah. either mentally or physically. That, that interrelationship is really, really well demonstrated. And we know what those things are. You know, we don't need to be told them. And we need to, I think a lot of it also comes down to strengthening our communities. You know, we've become very, very fragmented through technologies from the way so it's protecting, you know, especially in the, the West, and we need to love and support one another. And we need to tend and nurture ourselves and our physical and mental health in tandem with the environment, because these two things are interrelated. That, that was actually quite quite specific, and I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you said that because I, I do think we do need to hear about the small things each of us can do to have a, a ripple effect, like you say, in, in in our communities. Are you are you positive, or are you? Uh, um, I don't want to use the word scared, but are you concerned about uh, um, what is being done now to to protect biodiversity and 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 uh, uh, the awareness people have about the the urgency mm. of, of 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 the overall landscape. So I think I think first thing to say is it's vital that we open our eyes and we acknowledge what we've lost and we've lost so much things are really bad and we have to engage I think in some sort of collective grief about it. We have to like look at it wide eyes and go okay, this is really bad. We need to mourn what we've lost, but we need that grief not to paralyze us, but in fact, to channel us, you know, um, to energize us and make us hopeful. And there are reasons for hope. You know, there has been this massive rise in activism and we need to keep going as activists. And as a science community needs to work with activists mm -hmm. to make sure they're informed by the most accurate things. So, you know, there needs to be activism with integrity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are other reasons to be hopeful about the nature it she has a place at the table now, you know, it, ministries of finance are talking about nature in a way, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's much more prominent in the conversation. But we need to accelerate this and we need system change, don't we? And I think we need to value the quality of life over material wealth and we need to value the connection with nature rather than its conquest. 
you know, and mm. with this in mind, so we need to hold our governments to account that they stop subsidising the destruction of the climate and the biosphere. You know, I think humans have radically shifted their behaviours and their beliefs before, and now we're at the point where we need to we need to, to, to precipitate that, to, yeah, do the same precipitate that 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 tipping point. So I'm not optimistic in the sense of think will everything be okay, you know, but I am hopeful in the sense that I think we know what we need to do. And we need to be starting it right now. You know, there is time, which makes me hopeful, but there isn't a moment to waste. I have a final question, and it's a link to the last episode of, of our series, which will be f focused on marine biology. So uh, we've talked about species overall. You've also mentioned the importance of uh, preserving the, 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 the coastal ecosystems. Um, tell us about the importance of many times what we don't see which is underwater in our oceans and what covers so much of our planet as well. So kind of to, to help make a pre-introduction of, of the next topic that we'll discuss from your experience, what is happening mm. in, in our oceans and, and how threatened is, is, is the, the, are, are, are the species uh, uh, living, mm. living in, in, in our maritime uh, uh, environment? Well, yeah, we are we are a watery planet, aren't we? Most of our, our Earth is ocean, but one of the issues is that it's very most of it is very inaccessible. But we know enough about what's there or what should be there to be able to say that we've lost. You know, as I said to you earlier, you know, eighty yeah. percent of fish have gone from the oceans, and we have got you know there are hundreds of thousands of, of industrial scale shipping you know vessels out there which are trawling the you know and the ocean depths and, and are really really having a hugely huge impact on the biodiversity we know about but we also know that we've barely scratched the surface in terms of understanding the diversity and complexity of species and species interactions within those environments so whatever estimates we have on species loss are likely to be gross underestimates and yet the health of those ecosystems influence the health of the the bits that we can see so people are sort of i think too much in in partly around reasons of tractability and visibility, people sort of separate land from ocean, but what happens in the ocean affects what happens on land. What happens on land affects the ocean. So we're really harming, you know, ocean health, not only because of all the overfishing for food production, but all the pollution and the runoff that's creating these anoxic zones and these dead zones. And the problem is, is that if you damage the ocean ecosystems and all those, those ecosystems actually protect us from things like climate impact and, and also those, those ecosystems that draw down carbon are also compromised. So we're actually accelerating, um, you know, those harmful effects by not looking after our ecosystems, but not thinking about it holistically. All right. Well, look, Natalie, I think um, I've certainly learned a lot during our, our, our conversation. I'm, I'm sure our audience has as well. I think this, this process of, of raising awareness around different factors which are affecting the future of the planet and the health of all the species, including ours, um, is, 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 is crucial. So I, I really appreciate the time you, you've taken to, to share your, your insight and, and expertise with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Natalie, and good luck with, uh, with your project at, at the University of Oxford as well. Um, Thank you. De facto, uh, tive a oportunidade de aprender imenso sobre a importância da preservação da biodiversidade e uh, não só como é que está a ser afetada agora pelas alterações climáticas, como também o impacto que pode ser para nos proteger da aceleração destas alterações no, no, no futuro. Um, penso que a Natalie foi clara relativamente à urgência que existe para alterarmos muitos dos nossos comportamentos como uh, a espécie para proteger as outras espécies que estão à, à nossa volta. Um, teremos oportunidade de voltar num futuro breve para o último episódio desta série. Iremos falar sobre um, a, a biologia marinha e também uh, o que é que está a acontecer nos nossos oceanos e o que é que pode ser feito para os preservar. Até breve. Thank you.